fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. So uh, joining us today is uh, Wayne Perry, um, right from the Massachusetts area where this happened. How are you doing today, Wayne? Um, to work okay. Okay. Um, now, now it, let's let's. Um, I came across you on Facebook. So, uh, tell us how you're involved in the case, or how you got involved. All right. Well, um, my sister happens to be one of the victims, but uh, I'll tell you how that came about. Um, this all happened back in 1988, in the summer, the spring and summer of 1988. Um, they believe the first. Um, one lady that was missing was, I think she was, a couple of them were reported missing. This one was reported, I believe, was in April of, of 1988. Um, from April to September, a total of 11 women went missing. Um, the first body, they, they actually realized that there was uh, murders were being committed on July 3rd, 1988. The first body was found on uh, the side of a highway 140 in southeastern Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, they just thought it was just, you know, a, a regular murder, which I guess if you can call murder regular, but they had no idea what was about to start. And, uh, it, boy, it, it hit fast. I mean, in a matter of, I believe, six months, nine bodies, they just kept piling up on the, on the, the highways. Um, well, anyways, my, uh, my mother's birthday happened to be in October. October 9th, it was. My sister, Debbie, her name was Deborah DeMello, it was a married name. She, uh, she had never missed uh, a birthday of my mother's ever. Whether he, either she came to the house or she would make a phone call or send a card, but she never missed it. Well, my mother's birthday came and went. My birthday, November 7th, came and went. And it was kind of strange, but on November 8th, I happened to be watching the news. And um, by this time, you know, there was a few, uh, there was two bodies that had been found. So anyways, on November 8th, I'm watching them, and all of a sudden, it breaks in that they had, uh, another body has been located on um, 195 eastbound side of, uh, down in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Uh, it was called a Reed Road exit. So I'm watching them, and so thinking to myself, man, another body, and then I'm watching them carry this body out. But the words were exactly the same. They did a body bag. Most of the bodies that they found were skeletal because uh, it was one of the hottest summers on record out here then. And uh, all these women were murdered during the spring and summer, so there wasn't much left. But um, anyways, I'm watching them bring this uh, black body bag up from the woods. It was uh, just about dark time, put it into a hearse. And um, didn't take it up, my lady said, take it again. Well, there's another one that's a fight. And that's when they realized they had a serial killer uh, because of the way they were being found all on the side of the highway. So um, anyway, it's great. Uh, well, 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 when they, you say they were found by the side of the highway, so what was what was this uh, um, serial killer doing to them? Was he like uh, 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 pick them up somewhere, attack them, and then uh, rape yeah. and kill them type thing? Well, what it was is most most of the women had had either a drug problem or some were doing prostitution, and I'm really touchy on this part because my sister had issues, and all those women did. But if you were, li were living out here that time. The media made it like it was okay that these women were dead because they weren't high class, you know, um, uh, rich people with, a, you know, a fancy last name. So, I mean, I, for 30 years now, I have been arguing with people over, I just don't understand. They, instead of just calling me, oh, hey, uh, Deborah DeMello died or Sandra Botello died, was murdered. It's uh, that prostitute or that drug addict. I, and it's just, I don't understand why they have to label someone who's been murdered. Because of what they did in the past, they weren't hurting nobody. You know, they would they they had addiction problems, and and some of them to you know to to feed that addiction, they went into prostitution. And 
it's just the way that the, the general public even saw that they tell us. They were looking at them as uh, the prostitutes. One guy on a radio station made a remark that there was nothing but a pile of dead hookers. He put that on the air out here. And wow. uh, I, was, I was found it out with a lot of people, you know, it just, my mother used to sit home and cry at night because of the things she would see on TV that they were calling her daughter and all the other women. You know, what, what, what are you supposed to think? I mean, it's like, it's, it's like, it's their fault they were murdered because they had a problem. Doesn't matter what kind of problem you have, you don't deserve to be murdered. But they made it like it was okay. Yeah. No, it, it's a terrible thing. So when this started happening, this was in um, 88, I believe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, what was the atmosphere then around the city? Like when, the, when, when it started, when they started finding girls, um, was the city panicked or, or did they just... Well, at, at first, like I said, they just thought it was just another murder, the first couple. But then when they found my sister, and I didn't know it was my sister, on November 8th, um, that's when the, um, one of the detectives from the New Bedford Police Department started putting two and two together and was, started believing that they had a serial killer, an active serial killer in the area. And um, I guess uh, the FBI was called in. There was a bunch of different law enforcement agencies that were involved. None of them got along. They all fought. They withheld information from each other. This is the way this whole thing went from the beginning. But... um. They would, they would hang, the girls would, the most of them would hang around this section of the best called the Well Square area. It's where there was bars, and that's where, you know, a guy, if he was looking for uh, a, a prostitute or whatever, that was the section to go. Everybody has that area in, the, you know, a city or a town that they know where to go if, that, if that's what they want. You can buy drugs there or whatever. And um, there was a lot of, you know, undercover um, detectives that used to, you know, uh, work the area, and they started realizing that these different girls that used to, they used to see every night, all of a sudden weren't there anymore. And a couple of them, like I said, uh, they were reported missing, one by, one by her, uh, his, her boyfriend. One, uh, one of the victims' name was Nancy Piver. Her boyfriend, I guess, had a real bad police record, and uh, he actually went into the police department in New Bedford and reported her missing. And they were so shocked because he had never gone into a police department without handcuffs ever in his life. And they actually, at the time, um, had him as a suspect because... Uh, of his past, so I guess he had a violent past. But, um, so anyways, like I said, um, it was an area in the Bedford, it was just a, a low-scale area that the girls decided missing from. And um, as I was saying about my sister, you know, she, she didn't uh, get a hold of my mother or, or, or any, any of us about uh, her birthday, my birthday fast. So I started thinking, and my wife mentioned to me, she, I had a feeling all along that maybe my sister might have been one of them, and I, I just didn't want to believe it, so I just so I put it to the side. Finally, one night, uh, my wife said, Wayne, you got to call. So I called uh, the Bristol County District Attorney's Office, which is uh, the county uh, that's is, uh, the, the district attorney that's in charge of that, uh, that area down there in the Bedford. And they put me to, through to, uh, to a special state police unit that was uh, investigating it. And I talked to a, um, a lieutenant at the time. His name was uh, Jose Gonzalez. I got to know him as Josie. And uh, his partner, Mary Ann uh, Dell, who were two uh, pretty high-ranking state police troopers there. But anyways, um, they asked me a bunch of questions, and um, I answered everything I could think of. And just before he was about to hang up, he says, he goes, oh, wait, wait, hold it, hold it for a minute. He goes, did your sister ever have any broken bones? And I says, uh, I started thinking about it. I said, no, she, no, she didn't have, never had anything like that. And then we were about to hang up again. I go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I had remembered one time when she was in a women's jail in Massachusetts, Framingham, Massachusetts, that she had had a fight with somebody in there and she had broken her wrist. So I said to him, I said, uh, yes, I said, now that I, now that I do remember, she did have a broken wrist. And right down there, his voice changed. He goes, oh, she did. And it was like a totally different tone. And I said, yeah, she, she's happened in a fight. And he says, do you know which one it was? And, and I, I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was the right. He goes, the right, you say? I said, yeah, the right. And right then he just wanted to get rid of the phone. He goes, oh, okay, okay, Wayne. He says, um, well, thank you for calling. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll look into the information you gave us, and uh, we'll let you know what's going on. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, okay, well, like I said, that was, uh, that was probably maybe around the, my birthday was the 7th. 
probably around the November 10th and November, November 11th. Well, um, the the way that they notify you, I think they do in every state, is uh, if there is a murdered victim, you know, um, they find out that it, it is a, a a positive ID that comes to your house. Well, December 24th, 1988, Christmas Eve, I get a knock on the door. And I opened the door, and um, it was uh, Mary Ann Dill and uh, Josie, the two state troopers that I had talked to on the phone. I knew right then that that was my sister, because, uh, I mean, why would they be at my house on New- uh, you know, Christmas Eve? So yeah. I let him come in, and we, we talked, and uh, he told me uh, that she was the body that was found on Reed Road on November 8th. I literally watched them recover my sister's body out of the woods that night on TV and didn't know it. Uh, my, so what 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 was he doing to the victims? Was it was it uh, was there anything uh, unique about the killer's mo? Well, what, well, I mean, what was strange about it is all of them were found like within. Well, most I'd say, uh, yeah, well, actually, the nine that was found, yeah, they were all found like right off of uh, the highway or off of uh, the highway exit ramp. My sister, and they believe uh, he was um, he was raping them. They believe the way he was that he killed them was by strangulation. They know for a fact some of them because they found them um, um, like I think a cord around uh, one of them's um, you know neck, which like I said was at the time was all skeleton, and uh, some of them got scars around their neck, and you could see how they had uh, I guess the way they could tell that they had been tightened. So that was what they figured was the uh, cause of death, strangulation. Um, but he was playing games with uh, the police because. My sister's body was found on the eastbound ramp of um, the re-road exit on Route 195. Well, this girl I was telling you named Nancy Piver, her body was found before my sister's, but they didn't get an ID on her until after my sister's. But anyway, they found her body, Nancy Piver, on the westbound off-ramp of 195 re-road exit. And with Nancy was my sister's clothes, and Nancy's clothes were with my sister. They didn't know each other. He was like taking the, you know, one victim's clothes and putting them with another one, just put, like playing games with, with the cops. Um, nine of the, the bodies were found. Two of them have never been found to this day. The two that haven't been found, there, one of them, his father was a New Bedford police officer. The other one was, uh, her uncle was a New Bedford police officer. And it's like he deliberately hid these bodies extra special so they wouldn't find them. I mean, it's a, that's what a lot of people think. I mean, he just he did that deliberately, um, you know. So, just to play games. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and, no, it, it, how how did the how do you think the uh, law enforcement were were treating this? <laughs> well, let me put it this way, okay. I, I I found this out years later. Okay, at the time there was a district attorney. His name was Ronald Pina. Boy, that, uh, that he could talk up a storm. He could play anybody, and he played all the families. He had us thinking that there was this guy, and uh, it made sense at the time. There was a guy's name was um, Kenneth Pont. He was a lawyer in the city of New Bedford. He had a real a shady background. He had been known for doing drugs now and then. He would always take the um, the cases that you know, uh, what do you want to call it? low life cases or whatever. I, I don't know how you want to describe it, but yeah. Um, he was friends with Ron Pina at one time, and Ron Pina, um, which we, like I said, I found out years after, uh, he had a celebrity uh, girlfriend. Her name was Sheila Martinez. She was a TV news, uh, news person on uh, Channel 10 in Rhode Island at the time. They were both real bad into cocaine, the district attorney and her. And it come, it come to find out that Kenneth Pont was supplying the drugs to them. Well, there was some kind of arguments that had happened over the, you know, the years that they were working with each other. And Ron Pina had a vendetta against him. He wanted to have him put in jail. He literally tried to frame him for the murders of those women. He had him indicted by the grand jury, which the charges were dropped eventually. And he totally just destroyed the guy's life. The guy was no angel. Far from it. The guy was a scumbag. He was a lawyer. He knew all the girls. Now, jumping back a little bit, um... Christmas of 1987 was the last time I seen my sister, okay? But we, she was in jail at the time. She was in jail at a, a, at a Rhode Island um, women's prison, Rhode Island, uh, it was in Providence, Rhode Island. But we went down to the her, and she had really cleaned up her act while she was in jail. 
She had got her GED. Um, she's just, I don't know, she just totally had a different attitude. And she was telling me, my, my mother and her daughter, Chandra, at the time was, I think, 16, 15 years old, um, how she, this lawyer had come in, and she never told us his name. And, you know, he, he wanted to help her. He was that kind of a guy. He liked to help women, stuff that, you know, had drug problems, stuff like that. And that he would, was, he had a house down in Port Ritchie, Florida, that, you know, he was going to take her down and, you know, get her cleaned out, up and, and, you know, just try to get her back on her feet. Well, come to find out, then, um, this lawyer, I mean, she, like I said, she never told us his name, but, I mean, then after the murders took place, you know, this, all of a sudden this lawyer pops up, Kenneth Font, who happened to know just about all the women who were murdered. So the cops were using that as a, uh, you know, as um, ammo against, uh, against the guy saying that, you know, he, you know, he did have a reason to kill him. He knew them and they, he was selling drugs and he was beating them and raping them and stuff like that. But, um, like I said, the, the Ron Pena, I mean, he wasted months, months and months of investigative time just on Kenneth's pawn. He wouldn't get it out of his mind. He knew it wasn't Kenneth's pawn, but he wanted to get the guy put in jail because of some kind of drug, bad drug deal that had gone, gone down between him and, uh, like I said, his celebrity girlfriend there and, and uh, Ken Vaughn, you know, the three of them. So, um, boom. Well. Okay. Uh, I was um, gonna, but did they did they um, uh, were the police in general um, supportive and really trying no. to find the person? I don't believe so. No, no. There was some. There was some. The, the police did more fighting amongst each other than anything. The, the district attorney's office, Ron Pena, they all have a state police unit that's in there. They they were arguing with each other. The Ron Pena didn't want the state police in there and. He didn't want this, and he didn't want that, because of the reason why that we know now is because of what he was doing. Um, uh, the police departments were, would not share information, because at one of the bodies was found in a different county, Plymouth County in Massachusetts, uh, a town, little town called Marion. Actually, she was the last body, the last one that they had found. She was found in um, May of 1989, that's where the last body was found. And it just so happened, like, it was, like I said, it was in the county next to Bristol County. So right down there, now you've got two counties, two district attorneys, totally two different uh, state police directors dealing with this. Just total chaos. So the small t- each town that they found the body in, like they found my sister in Dartmouth, Dartmouth police were involved. They found bodies in Freetown, Freetown police were involved. There were so many police departments, and all of them were arguing and fighting and not sharing any, anything they knew. They would not share with each other. So, you know, I mean, whatever they had, if you put it all together, maybe something could have been done. Maybe it could have been, it could have been solved. But, you know, um, it's, uh, they, they were all, in my opinion, I, I call it, they were all having uh, uh, major ego trips at the time. And because of that, uh, everybody would say this, that the, um, the, the murderer had been basically just walked out of town. He just walked away. So, Some people think that uh, the guy went to uh, Connecticut, uh, that South Africa. Right when these murders stopped in, in Massachusetts, they started down in uh, an area in Connecticut. They called them the Route 8 uh, murders. Now, the highway, and it was, it was killing girls down there. But we don't know if it was connected, but a lot of people think it was. Uh, were there any I, other I, I, suspects? Oh, yeah, yeah. There was, uh, there, was, uh, there was, actually, there was numerous. This was, this case of the Bethlehem Highway serial killings is the second biggest murder investigation in Massachusetts history second only to the Boston Strangle back in the 60s, okay? And it was handled, um, the, 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 the police departments that were handling it had never, ever had any experience in serial killers, do nothing about them. So basically, they were like a uh, on-training type thing. There was numerous um, suspects. Some of them stood out more than others. There was a, um, uh, an Anthony Anthony Graza, they called him Tony. Tony. Um, um, he, um, the thing about him is, uh, and, I mean, I don't know if you know much, I'm sure you do, but uh, serial killers don't, they'll either kill everyone that they get, that they they go after, or they'll, they, they won't kill them. Well, he was being charged at one time for the rape, and attempted rape of, of like, I think it was 17 different uh, uh, women in New Bedford. Um, so they were trying to make it sound, they, they wanted to get this guy too. They were looking for anybody they could because... 
people were starting to get mad. Some of the public was was really stood by us. A lot of them did, but they were trying to it seemed to me like just to get anybody so they could you know just make everybody happy. Oh, we caught him, we caught him, whether it was the right guy or not. But um, they were trying to make this Tony DeGrazia look like that when he started, he went out there and murdered them, but now he was only raping them. Serial killers don't work like that. They don't. They don't leave nobody to uh, you know to um, identify them. Like I said, they either murder you or they don't. It's one or the other. But they don't rape half their victims and then murder the rest. And every, even even some of the the state police that I were friends with agreed with me on that. But um, the district attorney's office, you know, they were just trying to, like I said, push whatever they could because that Ron Pina had made a total disgrace out of the Bristol County one, and then. Um, he lost an election, a new district attorney come in, and, oh, he made it like, uh, we're going to, really gung-ho, we're going to get this case settled. He did nothing. I can literally count on one hand, and this is no lie, the amount of times that that district attorney office has called my family with any information. They just, there's no information given to any of us. Another guy named, another suspect, James Baker, he, uh, he was another one that knew a lot of the girls from Well Square. He used to let them stay at his house. He was a over the road truck driver. Now, a lot of the women, some of the women that had been uh, attempted to, uh, some of the attempted to abduct him, and they were supposedly seen in uh, a tractor trailer. You know, the tractor part of it. And uh, so they started believing that maybe it was a long haul truck. They don't go up and down the East Coast. Well, this James Baker just happened to be one, and he knew all the girls, and he also had been charged with rape and assault on some of the, the women, too, because, like I said, he had had them uh, staying at his house. Um, he was indicted to the grand jury as a witness, and there was a lot of other people that witnessed, too, but they were so, a lot of them had drug problems that they just, they're, um, they, um, I don't know how they described it, but, uh, they just said, uh, you know, the way, the way they told the stories just wouldn't hold up. You know, they just weren't, you know, one minute they'd have a, uh, you know, they'd tell you one story, and then uh, 10 minutes later it would change. So they couldn't use them. But uh, the James Baker guy, um, they, uh, they interviewed him for over four hours. He Supposedly they gave him a, po- a polygraph test, which they say he, he passed, but polygraph tests can be beat. Many people have done it. Um Eventually, after he got cleared, and very there was, not, there was no investigation on him at all, just a very little bit, you know, three or four hours, like I said, in the grand jury, and that was it. Um, eventually, the guy left the state and moved to Titusville, Florida. When he moved to, down there, all of a sudden, I think oh, three to four months after he moved down there, a serial killer became active in the area, killing women. And um, this guy, like I said, just left Massachusetts where they had the lever up dead, and now he's down there, and women are turning up dead now. Um, nothing was ever done about him down there. He ended up uh, dying in 2007, I believe, of cancer. But uh, there's a lot of people think that he had, you know, he had a, a, a lot to do with it. I've had people, like, you know, I have my website. I have people sometimes I get calls from people I don't even know, and they start talking about information and places and things, and they know what they're talking about. Because you know, I've had 30 years to do my homework, so I know just about every place there is down there, what to talk about, who the people are. And one of them who called me about three or four months ago was dead set that it was uh, James Baker. I guess she used to, um, when she was younger, she used to babysit for his kids. She knew him personally. And he was, uh, I guess she said he was, he was a weird type guy. Her stepfather was friends with this James Baker. And uh, her stepfather used to beat her mother. And this baker guy would come over there and watch while he would beat, the mother, beat her mother, and they would both just laugh at it. And he made a statement one time that he knew who the killer was, but he wouldn't say. The only, the only thing he did say was that, that, she had a, you know, that the killer had a girlfriend or a wife, and her, name was, uh, her nickname was, um, was Honda. They called her Honda. I'm thinking, well, maybe because she had a Honda car of some sort. I don't, I don't know. But uh, the, um, the, 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 the guy that, the, um, the name that he had originally given, they never mentioned it, so she never got that. But she has all kinds of information 
I uh, I have a um, friend of mine who works for state police, and uh, she tells me a lot of things that she's not that they don't know that she tells me she's not supposed to. So I got in touch with her, and I had her call this girl, and she took down a bunch of information, and they've been working on that too. I mean, um, the, the James Baker guy again; he's back in the light. Wayne, uh, I've got a sort of a off the sort of a beaten path question. It's a sort of a long yep. question. Uh, the uh, the the New Bedford Highway murders. Uh, there's a couple of there's a couple of, of girls missing uh, from from those murders or supposedly murdered. And uh, along the same time, I mean, almost uh, parallel. With the uh, New Bedford Highway uh, murders was the Colonial Parkway murders. Uh, now, in the Colonial Parkway murders, there's a couple. There's a couple missing as well from that. And there's there's some supposition with the Colonial Parkway murders that maybe there was more than one person involved. Has there been any uh, look into what? There maybe there was a, a connection between the two of those uh, separate. Uh, there's eight hours drive time, obviously between. Yeah. But has there been any like you know? Hey, is there a connection to any of this? Well, I've, I've heard to, uh, of some connections for, on a few different serial uh, murders. Um, I've heard. Um, I never heard that one. I, I guess uh, that there being any connection with that, but that's just like because you know I just might have missed it. I don't know. Um, the only connections that I had ever heard that were possible was the, uh, like I said, the one in Connecticut, which they called the Route 8 murder, uh, serial murderer. Um, there was one on Long, Long Island, I believe, in New York, that they were uh, trying to possibly put a connection to. And then there was another one out in Ohio. And they were basically, they were, they were connecting with them because they were saying they were the, the same kind of women, they lived the same lifestyle, they were found in the same way and believed murdered in the same way, and they were all around the same time. Now, before these New Bedford Highway murders, two years prior to that, there were five women murdered out in New Bedford. I believe, and a lot of my friends do, that know what they're talking about, that these murders started two or three years prior to 1988. I believe that those five women that were murdered before were victims of that serial killer. And there was two more that were murdered a few years after that people think that was uh, victims of head twos. So a lot of people think that there's 18 women this guy killed. That's how many I, uh, I've counted. And, I mean, it's just, it's it's so, um, it's the, I mean, the, the way that they, they, they happen, they're just so close and so identical to each other that it's almost like how could they not be? But, you know, um, they just, just, because to me, it's like, you know, well, you know, it's just a couple of years of uh, span that went by with the murders. Well, well, it couldn't be him. Well, yeah, it would be because some serial killers, you know, they'll, they'll, they kill for 40, 40 or more years. They'll kill for two or three years, and they start for a few years, and they see another active again. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, uh, there's variation. Some, some will kill for several years and then uh, yeah. possibly never kill again. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but, but I was looking over those two uh, as I was looking at the New Bedford Highway case uh, cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I remembered. Uh, I remembered the Colonial Parkway, and I remembered there were a couple of a uh, couple of people missing as well from that. And I thought, well, you know, that's sort of weird, but uh, yeah. things like that happen. But the more I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, maybe. Of course, there's like I said, there's eight hours drive time, so uh, well, but that's not the, undoable that at all. And it just, uh, you know, and and with the fact that the Colonial Parkway, like I said. Colonial Parkway murders. There, there is some talk that maybe there was more than one killer yep. involved in oh, those. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, some, yeah, I just, uh, I just wondered if maybe somebody had looked at that. Yeah. Um, so okay. What state is the Colonial Park murders in? Uh, those were in, uh, let's see, Colonial Parkway. I'm trying to remember what state that was. Virginia, Virginia. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Virginia. Okay, yeah, yeah. The first one I heard was, like I said, was Ohio. Um, as far as um, um, killer, killer or killers, um, here's another thing that was going on down in New Bedford at the same time these murders were going on. There's a, a place in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. It's called the Bridgewater, Bridgewater um, Institute for the Sexually Dangerous, 
what it uh, holds in there is uh, just basically scum, in my opinion, that shouldn't be allowed to walk the earth. Pedophiles, uh, uh, guys that have raped and murdered little kids, um, just, I mean, anything to do with a sexual crime, violent or nonviolent, are in there. Well, at the time, this was an election year, too, 1988. It was when George Bush and, um, and Michael Dukakis from Massachusetts were running. He was running, he was the governor of Mass, and he was running for president. I don't know if you remember that back then. Yeah. And um, Michael Dukakis had started a furlough program. And he, when he started it, it was just, you know, it was a, the type of furlough, you know, that they were going to let, you know, like not violent criminals out. Some of these guys that were in that Bridgewater place were murderers. They, you know, they, there was a sexual crime and murder, and murder resulted in that. Well, anyways, you know, uh, he was starting a furlough program, and there was supposed to be just, you know, nonviolent criminals that were let out into the public, and, you know, basically a test to see if they could go back into the, into the uh, you know, living with pub, the, uh, the general population again. Well, the people that were getting released were no angels. They were murderers, pedophiles, you name it. They were coming out of that sexual, uh, the Bridgewater Institute there for the sexual dangerous. All three of them, one by the name of uh, uh, Ron Leftwich, uh, Kenny Jr., and I can't think of the other one's name. Well, uh, two of them were living in the Wells Square area, uh, area of New Bedford at the time, where all these girls were missing from. They were uh, rapists. Uh, one of them was actually a murderer. So there was nothing new to them, I mean, as far as, you know, being able to hunt down a certain type of person if that's what they were looking for. They were allowed to be free six days and six nights per week and had to return on Sunday nights just to check in. And no supervision, no uh, daily phone calls. One day a week, you come back here on Sundays and check in. Um, one of them owned a white pickup truck. Um, there was a girl in New Bedford one night that had been abducted by a man in a white pickup truck. She just, she, somehow, he tried to um, handcuff her to the stick shift in the truck. Somehow she got away. I guess he had beat the hell out of her first. She, she got away and... Um, hysterically went to uh, one of the police departments down there. Um, when they interviewed her, she, she gave them uh, a description of the guy. She gave him the plate number of the truck and some other information. The plate number turned out to be from, from uh, registered to one of those guys. I think it was to Kenny Jr. Um, the description she gave was, uh, was like a, a photograph of him, the way she described it, and um, described the truck and everything about the handcuffs. They totally ignored her. Nothing was ever done. She left the state because she was scared for her life. She was, that, that they were, you know, that she had gone to the police department. They were going to find us out, and you know, she thought that she was going to be killed. She left the state. To this day, there's only a couple of people. Well, I know a lady who knows where the where, where she lives now. I guess it's down south. She was telling me, but um, it was things like this that uh, you know, information that was being brought in, but was just being totally overlooked. Now, why? What, what's the reason for that? If something like that you overlook, a girl coming in that's been beat, uh, you know, they beat the hell out of her. She just escaped from a, a guy trying to abduct her in a white pickup truck that a lot of the women in the area were complaining about. Um, handcuff, trying to handcuff her. She gives uh, the plate number, the registration number. She, uh, she identifies the guy and she, you know, basically, you know, tells him everything they need to own with the truck and they do nothing about it. Well, no, I can't understand why that was done. I mean, I don't understand it. Um, the the names that I told you that came out of that institute, they were never investigated. They were never looked into. They never stepped a foot into a police department the whole time. When they left, the, the, the furlough program ended because of, um, I, I think it was because of, obviously, you know, it wasn't being run right. But when the furlough program ended, you know, all those uh, guys were, were made to go back into jail. The murder stopped. It just, you know, we don't know for sure if it was them, but the murder stopped when they left, just like they did when Baker left. But, like I said, nothing ever came, you know, about it. They, they just ignored it. They ignored a lot of things. And I think, I mean, I don't know, being around the people now, the people that, you know, are, are really against what had happened, they believe, for some reason, we don't know why, they, that this case, they don't want to solve it. 
And it may sound strange and, you know, crazy, but they don't want to solve it. And I don't understand. They have um, six pallets with, um, with evidence stacked up five to six feet on each one sitting in the basement of a state police facility. Uh, I think it's over in Middleborough, Massachusetts. And you're telling me that somewhere in there, it, it, the answer's not in there, six pallets, six feet at all, filled with evidence. Well, why do you no think DNA. that they wouldn't want to solve it? Like, do you think that it's because there's no money in it, or do you think that they know the suspect and it might be someone they know that they don't want to that's, convict? That, that's been said, too. A lot of people also were putting, a at the time, a New Bedford narcotics uh, undercover not, uh, not, uh who supposedly they were saying was involved in these murders. This guy has died since, but nobody ever heard anything about him. There's, there's people out there that will swear that he was involved in these murders. But you never heard about him because he was caught. And those two other women um, that, you would, um, that you would ask me questions about a while ago, they were related to cops, too. I, I think I mentioned that before, but they were never found. They were hidden extra special, it seems like. Uh, a lot of people think it, it was political. It was uh, someone trying to destroy the Dukakis administration at the time. It, it, these crazy things have come up. But you don't know what to think any, anymore because there's no information ever given to us. None. Well, we've called, I've called the district attorney's uh, office down in Bristol County. Oh, okay, I'll, um, well, he's busy right now. I'll have him call you back. That was 10 years ago. I'm still waiting for that call. <laughs> my, 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 sis, yeah, my sister's daughter, Chandra, has called. She called it three or four times, three, three or four days in a row. What, oh, he's busy. He's got a, a very important case. We, he will get back. I think that was 15, 20 years ago. She's still waiting. Yeah. I, I, I lost it on them about a month ago. I just totally went crazy on the phone. But they don't care. They just ignore you and they just push you to the side. Um, tell the listeners about your website and what you've got on it and kind of what the purpose of it is. Well, the, the purpose of it is, is um, some, it's, some of the families it, it's that, you know, they're, they're, uh, their loved ones were one of the victims. Um, some of them just can't get over what had happened, which I can understand that, but you've got to get by it to a, to a certain point because if you don't, it's just going to eat you alive and nothing's going to get done because Lamar enforcement's doing nothing. So I saw nothing being done with any of this. You know, 15 years go by, 20 years go by, and then just recently the 30 years go by and, you know, some of the TV stations calling me and talking to me and stuff. And before this had happened, it was like, uh, I think about two years ago, I started just thinking to myself, these girls are going to be forgotten. They're, 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 their names right now are sitting in a basement somewhere, collecting dust. And each and every day that goes by, it just totally, it's, it's just getting further and further out of the minds of the people in the area. Some of the people are dead. Most, most of the, the victims' parents are all gone. You know? My sister would have been uh, 60, 65 years old today. I mean, well, on August 16th. She was 34 when she was murdered. Well, <laughs> So a lot of people have died, but and I'm just thinking, you know, eventually this is just going to be a case that's just going to be in the record books or whatever you want to call it. And people say, oh, yeah, I heard about that years ago, and that's it. It's over. Well, I don't want my sister's name to end like that, and I don't want those other girls' names to end like that. A lot of people say that I'm their voice now, and that's the way I feel. I speak for them because uh, nobody else will. I don't know why. It's like, are they afraid? I don't know. I ain't afraid of the police department. I ain't afraid of the district attorneys. They're not trying to sound like I'm a badass, and I'm not. I tell them, and I say, say it the way I see it, the way I feel it. If you don't like it, that's your tough luck. You know, I'm going, to, I'm going to speak my piece and what I feel because there's something definitely going on in, in, in the state of Massachusetts, in that in that county of uh, Bristol County, and there's some sort of a cover up. There's corruption. Something's going on. Nine, eleven women don't get murdered, and nobody knows nothing for thirty years. So that don't happen. I, I mean, it does. I, I can see, you know, like on a single murder or a couple. On 11 women, there's too many people that know. Somebody knows out there. Somebody knows what happened. And uh, I don't know if they're just afraid to tell. I, I don't know what the story is. So but uh, how, anyways, my how side, does I, it, I, how, I was going to say, how does something like this affect your your family and your life? Um, how did it affect you guys, uh, your whole family from then till now? Like, it, it, does it does it ever get better or easier? No. It, it will never get better. All of our lives changed then. Uh, on, on November 8th, 1988, uh, my, my life totally changed for good. 
my whole family did. Um, and it's never going to be the same. It never, never will be. And it just makes it harder when you, uh, it's when all you're getting is the feeling that nobody cares no more. As far as nobody cares, the people that can do something about it, they just don't give a damn. And uh, I've said all along, if, if, you know, if these girls were the, if it was the daughters of lawyers or judges or, you know, or, or booty actors, this case would have been solved. And if it wasn't solved by now, you can bet your ear they'd be out there every single day in army of them until they did solve it. But these, uh, these girls, uh, their lifestyle wasn't the type in their eyes I guess that deserves to be investigated and then you know, to, to get justice and, you know, the families get closure. We got nothing. We got, we got nothing. You know, uh, huh. it's just, we got ripped off is what we all got. And it's nobody cares. No, you know, no, you, were mentioning, okay, I, I, so you, you were mentioning one of the uh, girls that was killed was a police officer's daughter. Two of them were. One two of them was a police officer's daughter. The other one's uncle was a police officer. Those are the two that have never been found. There's just some weird things that happened. Weird things. Here's another one that's very interesting. Um, I believe it was a, maybe a couple months after the first body was found, a, uh, a letter was sent to um, the district attorney's office in Bristol County. And um, it was from an unknown, unknown person. And they said... Uh, that they had been on this road, in, it was uh, Route 88, and they had seen a uh, vehicle parked on the side of the road, and they um, and they believed that they had saw the guy carrying a body and bringing it into the woods. And they wouldn't say who they were, but they did say, if you do find a body in that area, then this confirms my story, and I will come forward. Well, sure as hell, about a month later, they found a body exactly where she said. It, was, it turned out to be a lady. They didn't tell us who, who she was, but we did find out it was a female. They found a body exactly where she said they would find one. But that was the last she ever heard of that. She never heard anything more. You know? Hmm. She, she had got a description of the car. I don't, I don't believe she got a registration number, but she, uh, there's a lot more information that was told. I mean, you know, that they, they didn't tell the you know, general public. Nothing was ever done about it. This lady saw who, who the killer was. She saw them. She saw the guy... One, yeah, I mean, the, there was only one that she could see, I guess. I don't know if there was others. She didn't see any others that, you know, that she mentioned that I know of. She might have, but, but, you know, like I said, they didn't tell us. But she saw this guy carrying a body out of the car and bringing it in some woods. And they found the body, right where she said. So, Neil, Why wasn't the, anything done? The, the, two, two, the two girls that were relatives of the cops and their bodies, mm -hmm. were, their bodies were never found, how, yep. did, how did police ascribe this to the, this serial killer? Like, what made them well, think it was this if they've never found the bodies? That, that, that's why I, I, I used to wonder, but uh, I guess it, it, they, they can't be 100% sure, but the two girls that were, that have never been found, exact same lifestyles, hung in the exact same areas, disappeared when all this was uh, happening from that area, and, you know, never heard from again. So, I mean... What's the chances of them being killed by... I mean, there's always a possibility that it was somebody else, but I, 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 I believe it also that it was uh, the, the serial killer that killed them, too. I right. believe he knew who they were. He knew the cops. I, a lot of people think that this guy is from the area. He knows the ins and outs. He, he's, he's someone that could be that could sit in there to stand right next to you, you know, with a, with a bunch of cops, and do would know it was him. That's what it was. And that's why this, this narcotic agent at one time came up uh, as being uh, involved in knowing who did it and was involved in doing it. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many different stories. I, I just, I feel strong in myself um, on Baker and the, the, the three guys from the, uh, the Bridgewater Institute there. Uh, I, have a, I have a friend of mine, he's an investigative uh, journalist. And he called me up. I didn't even know this guy. Well, Ten years ago, he called me up out of the blue. Never met him, didn't know who the hell he was. And uh, he um, had been looking into this case, you know, from, I guess, since maybe a month after, you know, it started. It, what, about a month after he actually realized that it was a serial killer. He got right into it. Started doing all kinds of, uh, you know, his own investigation. 
came up with numerous things. Um, I mean, there's, there's things about uh, from the church that that um, those those people that I told you from the, that uh, sexual institute, the church was bringing them to um, to stay in, in places down in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. One of them was a, was a registered, uh, I forget what class it was, uh, pedophile with children. They brought him into a, a church, and he was living in, in the rectory right next to the daycare center. This guy ended up uh, murdering the priest that was there. Eventually, he's in jail now for murdering that priest. It, it's, and this was a church town that was involved. But they set him up, they set those three guys up down in the vessel with, with that apartment they were living in. The church did this. They had the priest name. Wayne, uh, did they collect, were they able to collect any uh, DNA evidence on, no, on that, these uh, murders? Suppose, I mean, at the time, 1988, uh, DNA was at its infancy, you know, I mean, it just had become, become a possible source of uh, using for evidence. But like I said, these cops, none of them had any experience in any, anything like that. They didn't know nothing about serial killers. They knew nothing. Um, I've been told that there was DNA, then I've been told there isn't DNA. Then I got told by my friend, who, you know, I told you, you know, tells me a lot, she shouldn't. She told me, she says, uh, Wayne, she says, the DNA that they do have, okay, a lot of it was, um, was handled, it was mishandled, and it was uh, incorrectly packaged, which it was contaminated, so it's no good. But she said, what they do have, it would take a major, major breakthrough in technology, a DNA technology, to, to poss- possibly use. So that tells me it ain't worth, uh, you know, it ain't worth anything. I mean, she's saying a major breakthrough. Now, we have a lot of technology right now with DNA, and she's talking about another major breakthrough. So I think it happened in my lifetime. Yeah, well, you know, uh, on, on these victims, are they, I'm, I'm assuming that they kept uh, what clothing and items that were found. Have they not sent these items off or, or looked on these items for any trace evidence that you know of? Uh, from what I understand, it was sent to the FBI uh, crime lab. And um, the last time, actually, it was sent out again, from what I hear, back in 2000, I think it was 8. Um, but that was an election year for the district attorney. So this is, this is over again, quite us too. Every time there's a district attorney going to be reelected, oh, we're opening up the New Bedford Highway serial killing this case again. They're always opening it up. Uh, two weeks after he's in office, sitting on his fat ass, pardon my English, you don't hear another word about it ever again until the next election. That's how it's going. It's it's a game. It's a game to them. You know, we'll, we'll use that because they feel that that's you know that's political um, you know value to them. We'll use that until we're going to open the case again. You know, maybe we'll get people to, to vote for me, and I'll get in office. Once I'm in there, well, tough luck for them, and they don't do nothing. Right now, they have one one uh, state trooper working. She's a female. That's she's my, that's the one who's my friend. Um, back in '88, they had. 50, 60, 70 full-time detectives working this case, and they couldn't solve it then. How the hell do they expect one detective 30 years later to solve this case? I don't even know why they haven't doing it. It's, it's, maybe it's what they think that's going to shut us up because it doesn't. I think it's a total ridiculous, totally ridiculous. They're making a fool out of themselves, sticking one person out there to do this. Yeah. They can shake on it. It has yeah. to be an act of God for her to be able to, uh, you know, to solve this case. Someone would have to come to her and confess and have proof that he did do it. Because that's the only way that, that it can be done now, they're telling me. Someone would actually have to come to them, confess, but then prove that he was the killer. How do you prove you're a killer? Yeah. So um, basically, oh, the telling is never going to be solved. Okay. Uh, give, uh, give your website out to the uh, listeners. Yep. Um, it's actually uh, it's a Facebook group page and it's called um there's actually a book titled the same way but it's just a one little difference in it it's called shallow graves and then there's a calmer and it's the hunt for the new bedford highway serial killer now there's also a book like i said uh, written by a very good friend of mine and the book is excellent it's yeah. titled the same it's shallow graves with a semicolon the hunt for the new bedford highway serial killer the author is maureen boyle tells you yeah. everything yeah, we uh, we're going to have her on the show uh, next week. Oh, okay. Yep. Go through the book as well. Um, try uh-huh. to get as much exposure as possible on this, yep. and see That's see what, what happens. Um, I mean, I feel if it gets out there, someone 
hopefully someone will see this and say, hey, I know that. I know who did that. Or I know this. Anything. It only, take, it only takes the smallest amount of information to turn this whole thing around. You know, exactly. I don't have any confidence in it anymore. I have no respect for them. The only thing I have left is hope. That's it. Yeah. Well, um, our guest has been Wayne Perry, and we've been uh, um, t- talking about our new crime that uh, um, we're, we're just getting into now. And like I said, Maureen Boyle will be here next week talking about her book, Shallow Grave. Um, well, Wayne, thank you very much for taking this time to talk to us. I just I just want to say one more thing, too, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, since 1980, there are 240,000 unsolved homicides in this in this country 240,000 that's since 1980 I don't even know what the numbers are before that something that's got to be done as far as the law is being changed in this country after a certain amount of time the victims families should have the rights to be able to look into the records that they have obtained and evidence because as long as that sits on the shelf and they do nothing how can it be solved if, it, if it's not being worked on the families could hire their own private investigators to look down on it 100% just that, uh, you know, that case and on their own time. But as long as there's a murder investigation open to this country, nobody sees that. Nobody sees that information. Nobody can touch it. Nothing can be done. So as long as the police want to sit there and do nothing about it, well, you'll get your answer the same way. You'll never get one. I don't, don't believe, like I said, that I will ever get the answer that I'm looking for. I hope I do. I just don't have that confidence anymore. I used to. I, I just know too much now. But 240,000 homicides that are unsolved cold cases. So um, think about that. You know, something yeah. has got to be done. And, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, what, that's another thing I'm trying to get going. I'm trying to get people to being together. Because you're not going to do it as one. It's going to take a bunch of us. But yeah. that's exactly. the only way things are going to change. Well, thank you, Wayne. Well, I uh, appreciate you guys giving me the time because, like I said, I just want to get it out there. Hopefully somebody will know something someday and maybe it will be solved. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.